Can a piece of Tupperware really help your photography? Stay tuned to find out. Hi there, Spence here again for another video. Um, today I thought we'd do something a little bit different. It still applies to photography, but something that you may not have thought about. A couple months ago I got into something called geocaching. And we're going to go over exactly what that is and how it works and you know why does this apply to photography. So one of the things that I found when I started doing this is it took me places in my local area that I never knew even existed. So I've lived in southwest Florida for over 30 years and I have recently found parks, marinas, um, other neat little places to go shoot that I never even knew existed. But this geocaching has led me there to see, see what's, what there's there to offer, to have offered. So it's really a neat little thing. So let's back up for a minute. So what is geocaching and why is this something you might want to play with? Um, basically, geocache, what, what a geocache is, it's um, a container that somebody has put somewhere on the earth. And what they do is they give you coordinates to find it. And when you find it, you sign the log. And um, if you want, you can trade little items that's inside for, for other things. Um, and basically that's, that's the fun of it. And it's just the whole reason why it was designed was to help get kids off the couch, get people outdoors, go enjoy their parks and things like that, and not be stuck in front of the television or playing video games all day. So uh, another reason why I started looking into this is um, if you see in my other videos, I'm not exactly the lightest bear. So this gets me outside and it gets me exercise and I don't feel like I'm like at the gym doing the you know, treadmill and all that other stuff. Because uh, that's just not going to work for me. So this gets me out. Sees all, I get to see all kind of places, um, experience new things, and there's I found some really neat new, new places to to go photograph. So what I'm going to do today is I have uh, the front camera, which you guys are going to see here, and then I've also got the overhead camera set up. And I'm going to kind of show you exactly what it is you need to get started, and then I'll show you on the computer, uh, the website and talk a little bit about the apps. So, all right, so we can go ahead and get started. So really all you need to get started with this, and chances are you already have these two items, is a pen. <laughs> if you don't have a pen, they're real cheap, right? And the other thing is some kind of smart device. So you can use your iPhone, your Android, if you have a tablet, as long as it has a cell connect. Uh, so when you're out in the field and you're looking for things, because this is what using the app on this is what's going to lead you to these containers so you can find them. Um, now if you don't have, I have friends that have flip phones, they don't have a smart device and that's fine. There is another way that you can can do this and not need uh, one of these. So this is the bare bones minimum of what you need to get started is a pen and some kind of smart device or let me just go ahead and pull out something here real quick. If you, uh, if you don't have a smart device, then this is something else that you might want to consider. It's, uh, this is a handheld Garmin. And what you can do is you can, via the website, you can download uh, the information where the caches are in your area and you can download it to this device. And this will lead you to those like the phone would. The advantage of this is a couple things. First of all, it runs on AA batteries, so if you're going to go hiking, biking, you're an outdoors kind of person anyway, uh, the batteries, batteries will, can easily be changed where a smartphone, you kind of need um, you know, some kind of special charger or a um, external charger is what I'm trying to think of. So that's a plus. Uh, so I just put two rechargeable AA batteries in this. Now the other thing is once you turn the GPS on your smart device, your phone will say, uh, you might get, depending on the battery and everything, you might get three, maybe four hours of juice on a full charge because that GPS signal does, you know, the, when the phone's trying to acquire satellites and everything, it does uh, use quite a bit of power. With this, uh, with the two AA batteries, I can get about 16 hours. So there is quite an a increase in usage time on this, and this could be important for Let's say some of you are really uh, outdoors people and maybe you're going to go hiking 
in some remote place and you may not be able to pull up and just plug in someplace. Uh, you might be out in the bushes, you can't exactly pull up to a bush and plug in, right? So um, this would be a great little thing because AA batteries are small and uh, you can just pop a new set in if you need to after about 16 hours and there you go. The other advantage of this is you can read the display in the sun. So in full sun, you can read this. I know it can be a challenge to uh, see the phone or your tablet in full sun, but this you can see. And the other thing that's in the geocaching community that's it's kind of like the old Mac versus PC debate is whether the handhelds or these are more accurate so I kind of, when I got started, I said, I'm thinking about getting a Garmin. I said, what do you guys think? And that was like opening up Pandora's box. I didn't realize it. So um, to be honest with you, I've only used this a couple times so far. And the last time I had them side by side like this, and I was going around trying to find the cache and they were both pretty close, but that was on a clear day down here in Florida, no obstructions and it did okay. Now, where this excels, as far as accuracy goes, as I've been told, is if you get in heavy canopy. So this might be great for those of you up in the Washington, Oregon, that neck of the woods. Um, if it gets real cloudy, like sometimes it does down here, real thick cloud cover, this can supposedly punch through that and still get the signal. Uh, this works off the US and the Russian satellite system. So it's, I'm able to go on here and see exactly how many satellites and what the strength is that I have, where I've not been able to figure that out on the phone. So again, and the other nice thing about this is you don't need cell service for this to work. So anywhere in the world, there's a, you know, you can get GPS. It might not be a real strong GPS, depending on where you are in the world, but this does not require a cell plan. It does not require a data plan, any of that stuff. It's just you turn it on and once you paid your money, you just turn it on. Um, it will acquire the satellites and away you go. Now, one option that you do have is you can put maps on here. So uh, this did come preloaded with the United States, but you could put your area on here and then you would have the maps for that area. So that's the only thing that costs some money is if you decide you want to do that. But for geocaching, um, won't cost you anything. Basically, what I do is um, once I preloaded my my lists in here for the for my area that I'm going to go look, I just turn on the compass and just follow the compass, and that's it. I really don't care about necessarily the the map because um, this will get you within nine feet. Uh, this has got me within thirty feet. So this this has worked out really well. It's small as you can see. It's pretty hand. You know, it's easy to carry. It's light. Uh, they do make a device that you can clip onto this and it has a carabiner on it so you can put it on your belt and that kind of stuff. Or if you're going to go um, off-roading, you could even use something like this. So anyway, this happens to be the uh, Garmin E-Trex Touch 35T. Um, so again, this was actually gifted to me by a good friend and it's really great, uh, really great device. So anyway, so that's how you can kind of go around and, and do some of this without you know, get, if you don't want to get involved with a, with a cell plan and all that stuff, which I don't blame you. So basically that's, that's it to get started. But as we all know, as you kind of want to get going, um, the actual geocaching site and app is free. So you can get started and do a lot for free. Probably your lifetime for free. They do offer a subscription for $29.99 a month. And this is from, uh, company called GeoSpeak, I believe, and they're out of Was uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, you can go on their website and upgrade to premium. So what does premium do for, th for 30 bucks a month, let's call it? Um, it gives you access to all of the caches all over the world, and there's over 3 million as of right now. This is June 2018. So people are adding to it all the time. Um, it's, just, it's just really a fun thing. But if you have kids or grandkids and you're looking for something to do with them, you want to get them out of the house. If chances are somebody's got a smartphone in, in the you know in your family, you can download the app for free, create an account for free, and go start looking for this stuff. So that's that's the minimum. Now, if you uh, what I have done because again, like I mentioned, I'm trying to get some exercise, is I went ahead and bought. This was cheap. This was this outdoor products, and I got this at Walmart 
for a whopping ten dollars and what it is it's a little pouch that goes around your waist and it's got these two little these two little holders for uh, 20 ounce bottles of water it did come with bottles I just took them out you know make it simple for this so now there's all kinds of pockets so just some things that I carry with me for when I go out is obviously I have my pen and this is kind of like my first little line of line of defense here and I've got an extra pen because the whole point to this is when you find the cache you want to sign the log that proves that you were there now some caches can be small like the size of a pill bottle or less or that big and sometimes they can be as the biggest ones I found are like the old ammo cans and they're kind of a rectangular shape and they they're they're fun if you have kids because then there's stuff there's a lot of room and stuff in there to, to trade stuff out and kids really like that so I just basically have another pen as a backup so that's no big deal this is actually just some stuff I found um, we're gonna go over this this little bit of stuff here in a minute so we'll just set this off to the side for a second so sometimes these um, logs and things that you're going to be you're going to be working with are so small they're going to be hard to get out of these containers because again they could be like the size of your pinky so if you you know you try to tap them out they're not coming out that's where tweezers you can slide the tweezers in and then just pull um, the logs out so these are really helpful again you can get some of these your local discount store for next to nothing now the other thing that you can get is a log what they call a log roller so again trying to get the um, logs back into these itty bitty little itty bitty little holes is you got to really wind the paper tight so you can go out and get an official log roller from somebody what I did is I got a plain old bobby pin and I just slide this into the it's kind of like a cotter pin if any of you are familiar with those just slide it on one end of the paper or the log because the logs are kind of long and then I just roll this up like this and it'll roll real tight around your bobby pin or your cotter pin and then you just pull it off and then you can stick it back in the container if you need to. Now again, if you're working with something like an ammo box, I've seen log books that are like regular notebooks for kids uh, if they go to college or school or something like that. So those are much easier to work with and they're generally in plastic bags. So anyway, so there's, there's some, some things there. All right, so now some other things that I've decided to pick up along the way is you're going to find... See, so it kind of kept going. I kind of needed to get, uh, oh, I need to get this. I need to get that. But it's, this is all like cheap stuff. There's nothing here that's expensive, assuming you have the phone or you're going to do the Garmin thing. Once that's out of the way, you're, everything else is really cheap. Uh, some of the uh, pack uh, containers that you're going to find, they could be inside of a log. They could have um, bark and things piled on top of them. So... Because here's the thing, you don't want to leave these containers out just for anybody to find. It's, there's a term called muggles, and what those are are people that are not playing the game that could find a container and say, what is it? And they could take it home, throw it away, keep it, whatever, and then it's not where the app says it should be. So that's why um, they're, they're going to be hidden in plain sight, basically. And if you're going to go out in the woods, um, you know, I'm, I, I've lived in Florida a while. You got to be careful where you stick your fingers. <laughs> uh, it's like anywhere else, right? You stick your hand in some rocks or in some leaves, or you're not sure what you're going to find. So I just went on Amazon and got these extra large gloves um, to put on, you know, one layer of protection, which is kind of smart there. So there's that. Now, just a couple of other things I've picked up. Again, you can kind of use whatever. This is just things that I've picked up or carry with me along the way in my little pouch here and this works out really well. I got the extra set of batteries for the Garmin so we're all set there. So that's pretty simple. There's plain old Duracell uh, rechargeables. Now I was on a trip once and a bull was looking at me because I was inside of a pasture. It was a, um, uh, it was a park so we were on public property but a bull is, was kind of looking at me. I grew up partly on a dairy farm, and I know you'd never turn your back on a bull. And uh, sometimes with these parks down here, we have these feral pigs all over the place, and you get between mama and the little ones, it could be trouble. So I don't, I don't have a gun. So what I did is I went out and got me, you know, just a little knife, just in case. 
and not just for uh, protection, but I also got it for, there's times that I have got caught up in some vines. We have these stupid vines down here, and like I get in there and I can't get out, so at least I can use this to kind of cut the vines to get out. So again, if you're in a wooded area, these can be helpful. This, something like this can be helpful. If you're in an urban environment, because there are stuff, that, containers that are hidden in uh, the city, you wouldn't need anything like this because you shouldn't get you know tangled up in anything. Now something else that I've done, in fact, here's uh, one thing I can show you about the logs, is I've got some, re what these are called replacement logs. So if you come, acro come across the cache that's uh, got a damp log or is maybe it's missing, which I've found that, and you know I logged that on the, uh, on the computer saying, hey, your log was missing, so I added a new one. So I got these little plastic pouches, and you can get these at um, uh, Walmart. And if you, can, if you do a search for geocache log, then there's all different kinds and sizes. And this is basically what one looks like. So if I can get it out of the package here. And just to show you, so there it is. And that's, and so what you do is you basically just put your name and, and date it and that's it. And then you would just roll this back up with your log roller and put this back in the container if it's if it's a real small one if it's a bigger one you just write on the notebook so anyway so those are some replacement logs those are kind of and those are you know you just print those off on your printer at home nothing fancy there all right let's see what else we got here all right now these are just some other little specialized things again real cheap this is a back scratcher i think i um i think actually my mother gave this to me so it does work good to scratch in your back but um, there are times that, again, if you're going to be working with the foliage and things, you don't want to stick your hand in there, you can kind of telescope this out and then kind of move the debris away. Um, so anyway, that's cool. You can probably pick these up at, again, Walmart cheap or dollar store or something like that. Uh, I went to an automotive store, and what this is, it's a telescoping magnet. So some of these caches require uh, the you know, to use this to, to get the uh, cash out because if they're magnetized or something like that. So again, got this at the automotive store, cheap. So that was only a couple bucks. And now I'm 6'4". I don't do well bending over. So again, at the automotive store or Amazon, if you want, I got this articulating mirror. And again, it's telescoping. So there have been times where caches have been located um, under pathways or bridges or things like that. So this, you can kind of telescope it down and then you can kind of angle it so then you can look and see what's under there and you don't have to hurt yourself trying to, you know, bend it over and people are going to say, what in the world are you doing? Not that this would be any less inconspicuous, you know, why has that person got a mirror and they're looking all over the thing? Uh, that is another concern with all this. They call it stealth is you want to try not to be obvious of you know what are you doing but because again people who are not playing the game you know you don't want them to take the container so <laughs> um, but again I, I look a little maybe a little shady anyway <laughs> no, just kidding so anyway um, these are just some of the items that you can get and they're they're very very inexpensive and cheap um, so yeah so I think that's as far as it as as far as the stuff um, oh I do have one more thing in here and now, sometimes you will, they will hide these containers. Like for example, we have these round steel gates. I can think of like for cattle, but sometimes one end will be open. So again, I'm not wanting to be sticking my fingers in there and see what's going on. So I just went and got this um, pen flashlight. This one has to be from Coast. My wife got me a real big flashlight from Coast that I use every day for you know taking the dog out, things like that. So this one is just a little pen light that you can uh, look in little crevices and things to see if there's anything in there. So again, this was cheap. This I got at Walmart and it takes, uh, I believe, a AAA battery. So, so those are just some of the little things. You'll hear the, the term TOTT, tools of the trade, and then that's what, that's what these things are. So, all right, so basically that is that. Now, what do you do when you find a, a container, right? You sign the log book, we kind of talked about that. Then what do you do if you want to trade for something? So what you might find in the container, and I brought some things that I've actually found, you'll find all kinds of things. 
The rule is if you want to trade for something in a container, it has to be equal or better value than what you're going to take. So this is just something I found. Here is a um, bottle opener from this company called Ener Energisys. Yeah, so anyway. So I traded something for it, which I'll show you what I trade with. Um, I found this, this was kind of cool. Uh, this is a uh, key ring from Texas, or I assume it's something to do with Texas. Obviously it's on there. And you know, you'll find all kinds of cool things. Some people like these little, um, these little glass dots that says, you know, I have like this one says, I'm not lost, I'm geocaching. Uh, this one says, I love geocaching. So they get all kinds of different little things and trinkets. So here's what I do. And this is some of the nicer stuff that you'll find in these things. And it can be bigger stuff. Um, here's another like little gold plastic coin. See, it's plastic. I try to leave things that's kind of part of the game. <laughs> so, or that has to do with the game. So this is actually what I did is I went to Amazon and I got these cool little compasses and they were cheap. And the nice thing is, you know, I'm thinking about for kids. So if they get something like this, they'll be like, oh, this is cool. Now it doesn't work. It's not, you know, not like a regular compass, but you know, for something different than some of the things I just showed you, not that they any of that say less, this is just something that do more like the game is all about navigation, reading, you know, re reading maps if you want to use that. So try, I try to use something that has to do with that. So I got these compasses off, off um, Amazon. And the other thing I got just for fun uh, for the kids are these metal coins. Now you can hear these are actually metal. And again, I got these off Amazon and they kind of look like the old Spanish gold when they used, you know, back a million years ago, back when the, the Spain and all that was coming over this side of the, 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 this side of the world. So it's got some nice weight to it and it does sound, so if we, kids find this, they'll think it's great. And I also trade uh, different kinds of, they call this stuff swag, S-W-A-G, stuff we all get is what it stands for. And so I traded some things for um, some of these little horses and stuff. A friend of mine bought these and we traded some stuff, so I had something different to throw in there. Um, one of the things you will find in a lot of these is McDonald's uh, toys. I get it, you know, everybody's got a budget. But if you can get something like the compasses or the little coins, that's going to brighten a kid's day more than, you know, oh, here's a toy that's for kids two and over. <laughs> so that, that's something I would think about. But um, again, anyway, that's, that's kind of the basis of the stuff and, the, and how that works. Now what I'll do is we're going to flip over to the computer here, and I'm going to show you the website and how you can get created with an account and kind of how you can kind of get going with it. So, all right, so we're going to flip over to the computer here for a minute, and I'll be right with you. All right, so here we go. So we're going to take a look at the official website and uh, kind of just walk you through and show you kind of how this works, and we'll go from there. All right, so here what you basically want to do is you're going to want to go to geocaching.com. Don't worry about this play search. Just type in geocaching.com. It'll take you to this page here. Uh, if you don't have an account, I'm already logged in, so you can uh, just create yourself an account for free, and then you'll have, um, and you just pick a username and a password. So here is my username. Uh, in high school, I was big into Macs. I'm still a Mac user, so they called me Mac Master in high school and just stuck. So that's where that comes from, in case you're wondering. 77, you might be able to figure out why it's 77. If not, that's the year I was born. And it also has uh, how many finds I've got. So in this case, I'm up to 96. So I've only been doing it for a little while, so it's not too many. You meet people who have thousands and thousands of uh, finds. So anyway, so basically what you can do is, for example, if I put in our area, so we're in Punta Gorda today, Punta Gorda, Florida, and you can see right here it says plus 10 mile radius. So I'm just going to click on that. And we'll hit search up. Oh, it's going to do it. Now there's different kinds of caches, just so you know. You have the traditional cache, which are these green dots. That, that's basically 
if you find something like this, um, it's going to be a physical box wherever you're going to go. So it's, you go there, you're going to see a container. These are multi-caches, so what this does is you have to go to this location, sometimes do a puzzle, and then go to another location that's actually where the cache is. And then you have these mystery caches, which generally these are puzzles. I'm not big on puzzles, at least not right now, so what I do is I stick with these green ones. And that's because I know I can just plug in the coordinates or it'll come up on the app, and I go there, I'm going to find something, and away we go. Here it has the distance away. As you can see, this one's half, about a half a mile away, half a mile away. It gives you the favorites. Now, the more favorite points, the more somebody liked it. Like in this one, for this example, this one says can't hide here. You can see this one has got 56 favorite points. Uh, you also notice this one says premium. So the reason why I can see this and it's activated is because I do have that premium account. Um, so again, I'm not telling you to go out and hurry up and do that. I would do this for a while, and then if you really get into it, then spend the money. But, um, you know, you don't have to. Over here is the size. You'll see you have the choice of macro or micro and small. Start with, look for anything that says a regular if you can first. And here's a regular. This one here is called Duke. Uh, that one's a multi-cache. But, um, all right, here we go. Let's look at this one. Here's Butterfly's Loot. So this one's uh, about two miles away. And it's a regular. So regular is going to be like the size of the ammo can. Now, if you see something that says small, like this one here, it says the Spirit of Punta Gorda. So small would be like the size of a some uh, piece of Tupperware that you might put your sandwich in for lunch. That's about the size of it. Micros, they can be bison tubes. They're like little pill bottles that you screw the top on, they're metal, and they can be this, this small, and then they have ones that are smaller than this yet. Um, other, if you see some other, that could be, means a container doesn't fit into one of the other categories. So that could be like, you, it was slid into like the cattle gates we were talking about. Um, Sometimes you can get like plastic animals or, um, yeah, like I'm trying to think of one I saw was a lizard. And so it was a rubber lizard that they had opened up and put the bison tube and the bison tube was sticking out of the lizard's mouth. So that's the container though is the lizard. So <laughs> people get creative with this. Um, just a little, another little note on the icons. If you find one and you mark it as found, then you get the smiley face. And you'll see this when you start watching geocaching stuff or start hearing about it, they'll say, what's up with the smileys? I'm just here for the smiley. Well, the smiley is when you find it, you get the little smiley. Uh, there is a thing called a DNF, which means you did not find. And then you get a little frowny face, which means you got to try again. All right, so anyway, so this just gives you some ideas of, uh, oh, actually, let's look over here at the difficulty and the terrain. We'll, we'll finish looking at these so you guys know exactly how this works. So we have the size. The difficulty rating and the terrain rating goes from 1.0 to 5.0. One being the easiest or the easiest terrain, and five being the most difficult. So if we look at difficulty, this is how much brain power it's going to take for you to find this thing. So in other words, if I'm going to look for this can't find here, it's a micro and it's got a difficulty of two, it's probably going to take you a little bit of time to find it. It's probably pretty well hidden. Now, if you see the terrain, a lot of these are 1.5. That means it's probably near a walking path or something that's pretty accessible. You don't need anything um, special to get there. Now, if you see anything that has a terrain of four and five, let me just scroll down here and see if we have any of those. Because um, I'm thinking since we're here near the harbor. All right, here we go. Ponce de Leon, Mangroves Madness, Laguna, five. So what does that mean? Again, because I'm in Punta Gorda, Florida, we we're on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. You need a kayak to get to this one. So maybe where you live, you're near mountains. So you might need climbing gear to get to some of this. So you can see how some of these, like Alligator Creek Island, um, here's another Ponce de Leon one, uh, Mangrove Madness 2. So these are easy to find. They're just hard to get to. So that's something to consider. Um, and if another advantage of the premium membership, if you decide that's something that you want, you can go and filter out, say, look, I don't have a kayak. I don't have climbing gear. I don't want to deal with that. Give me all the ones. Show me all the ones that are terrain of 
maybe three or easier. And then it will filter out all those other ones so you don't have to concern yourself with that. All right, the last file, and this can be helpful because, for example, I was looking for one that was one block from my house. It had not been found since 2014. Nobody could find it. So they finally um, archived it or you know, got rid of it in the database just because it was, nobody could seem to find the cash owner did not um, you know, say, oh, I've checked on it or anything like that. So as long as it's been recently found, you just know it should be there. So that's a good thing. And it tells you when it was placed when the cash owner physically placed it in the location. So it's kind of fun to, you know, to look at some of these, like this one here was placed in 2009. So that was, that's what, nine years ago? So that's pretty good. Um, yeah, that'd be kind of a cool one to go see because that's an older one. But if you go through here, you know, you can see exactly like, here's this other one, this Hoot Gibson, right? That was placed 10 years ago, but it's been recently found. And so the cash owner is um, keeping up with this. And it's also got 34, uh, favorite points, but look at the difficulty. It's four and a half. So that one's going to take some time to look for. Anyway, so that is kind of the list. Now, lists are kind of boring. So if I go over here where it says map these coordinates, now it's going to pull up. Here is my local area, and you can see there's a whole bunch of them. So let me just go ahead and clear the search filter here for a minute. So it will reload. So here is, so I'm, we're kind of down in this area here today. So you can kind of see all these little green dots. <laughs> these are all caches. And you can see the little blue dots, those are the mystery caches, and then the orange dots are the uh, multi-cache. So one thing you can do if you're gonna be in an area, maybe you're gonna be visiting an area uh, for on vacation or just you're just gonna take a trip, maybe what you might wanna do is you could zoom out. This works off Google, um, yeah, Google Maps. And you can just zoom out. You can see Florida's got a few. <laughs> so this, like I said, this will keep you busy for a lifetime. You know, if you wonder if the United States has any, um, I would say yes. <laughs> and it goes up into Canada. There are caches on all continents. In fact, they're even in the seas as well. You have to dive for them. So you can see there's even one way out here. All right, so basically what we can do, let's just kind of get back to where, we're, um, where we are here today. So you just go to your local area that you want, might want to look around. And just to show you a couple things. All right, so let me just see where we're zooming in. Here's the Punta Gorda, downtown Punta Gorda. So if I was interested in saying going to look at this cache right here, this one has to be called Ant Cax. And let's, let's pick something I can actually pronounce. All right, here we go. Pioneering luxury. <laughs> I, I can deal with that one. All right, so if I click on this, it gives you the name of the cache. It gives you the difficulty rating. In this case, it's a one and a half. It's not too bad. Terrain of one and a half. It's got two favorite points. It also gives you the cache size. So here you can see this is that micro. This would be your um, small and regular. And I think this is the other designation. So Let's just say we're interested in this. Uh, I can go ahead and click on the pioneering luxury name and it brings me up. And now this is actually the cash page. So the cash owners put this together. Um, we can scroll down here. We can read about the cash description and it gives you some, some information. And here it says, beware of the muggles. Is, muggles are again, people who are not playing the game that might wonder what in the world you're doing. As you search for this cash, it's in a high traffic area. And there is a hint, if you want to sit here and do this longhand, go for it. But if you click this little decrypt, it says grab a seat. So that tells me it's probably a micro that's been magnetized that's on the bottom of a, a bench. That would be my thinking. As you do this, while you kind of start putting the pieces together, how this all works. So the first couple ones, that's why I say if you stick with the larger ones, they're easy to find. And plus, if you have kids and you're going to be taking them along, they're not going to get as frustrated looking for some little thing like this and all they find a little piece of paper. So anyway, so down here it says, oh, it says, it says it's so micro. So this is probably a really small one. And you can see all these people have found it. So this, the app works exactly the same on your phone. Maybe they have uh, iPhone or Android. So that has the hint. Um, it gives you all this information. So, and there's the favorite points. Now, something you can do is you can log a cache. So after you found it and you sign the log, 
you want to log it either on the phone while you're out and about or you're going to you can come here and log it and then what you do is you get the little you get the little smiley now let me just go ahead and back up one here now you can see in the area for example oops got a little too close there let's just back up um, back in 2004 we had a hurricane charlie come through that was pretty crazy so it was um it really uh, did a lot of damage, so they put a monument kind of statue thing and for Hurricane Charlie of the rebuild and everything. So here's, it's actually right here on the very point, and this one's called the Spirit of Punta Gorda, and you can see I have a smiley. So the smiley means that I found it. Now, if you, get, if you can't find one and you log it is a um, DNF or did not find, I'm just going to go over here a little bit to our coast because I know there's one area that I've looked and I've got a couple of DNFs. So for example, here's one in our neighboring community. This is Englewood, Florida. And here's a little blue smiley, or it's, I'm sorry, it's not a blue smiley. He's kind of, kind of frowning. Uh, this is your DNF, so it did not find. But if I go back and look again and I do find it, then I'll say log it and found it and it turns into a smiley. So but that's basically it. Um, it's really great, fun. As you can see, you got a few things <laughs> to work with. Um, as far as you, you could spend a lifetime doing this, and if you're on vacation, and you know, again, a big thing I keep thinking about is families. Uh, you may not have zillions of dollars to go to all the museums and see all the stuff. This could be something that you you know you're, you guys could do. All right, so what has this got to do with photography? Now we've talked about geocaching, how it works, how you can get go. So how in the world does this you know, tie into uh, photography? As I kind of mentioned in, in the beginning of the video, I think I kind of already said this, is again, it's taken me to different parks, places, uh, areas that I never knew existed in my own backyard. So uh, what I would say is when you go geocaching, take your camera with you. Uh, whether it's digital, film, whatever it is you're shooting, if your iPhone or your uh, Android or tablet is your phone, you'll obviously have that with you unless you're doing the Garmin. Then you take some really cool pictures of maybe some new areas and if people want to come down and you live here and you want to visit or uh, maybe you just kind of want to see the hot spots of an area when you go and you've never been there before, do some geocaching in that area, take you some cool spots. Really the whole idea behind the geocaching is they wanted to put caches where they want people to see some cool stuff. So since I'm here on the uh, southwest Florida, you'll see a lot of beach caches because obviously we get nice sunsets. Sunrises are on the other side of the state. Uh, so for example, you know, along the beach there, you get a lot of really cool uh, little caches that you can find. You can sit there on the bench and you can watch the sunset maybe before you go home. And that's the whole idea is to get people out and check it out. So anyway, so that's, that's been a big bonus for me is the exercise. I'm seeing new places that, you know, I've been here a long time that I never knew were here. And it's just a fun thing to do. And, um, you know, I've gotten some friends into it. We, we talk about it and it's just like, oh, okay, you, this is what you're doing? Yeah, okay. So anyway, give it a try. It's free. If you don't like it, they'll give you your money back, right? It's free. Uh, <laughs> um, again, the app, you just want to search for geocaching and the... Uh, App Store or the Google Play Store and it's the one that has the logo right here and you just want to look for this logo on the App Store or on Google Play and just download it's free give it a go so all right so I hope you enjoyed this video uh, we will be doing some more out in the field photography videos soon I've got some other things I'm working on in the pipe so that should be coming up here pretty soon so as always, I appreciate you guys spending some time with me and, and um, watching some of these videos. And hopefully if you like this video, you might give it a like and you might want to subscribe if this is your first time coming to my channel. Uh, again, I'm generally I'm more of a large format film photographer, 8x10, and I usually go out in the weeds and stuff and try to uh, get some interesting um, photographs of landscapes and abandoned buildings and things like that. So anyway, so check them out. As always, I appreciate you taking the time to watch.